Hey, what's going on, Who That Nation? It is yours truly, TJ Jones, the host of the State of the Saints podcast. And wait a minute, let me write up my lens real quick. There we go. It is yours truly, TJ Jones, the host of the State of the Saints podcast. And I want to say thank you all for taking a part in today's YouTube live video. Now, this one right here, man, I'm going to be honest. I'm going to be excited about talking about this one right here because, I mean, it's a little bit of that Kermit spilling of the tea, if you will. Delvin Bro, man, Delvin Bro unloads on head coach Sean Payton. Head coach Sean Payton and Delvin Bro was beefing before Delvin Bro was uh, released by the New Orleans Saints, man, and... Delvin Bro went on a podcast, okay? Uh, I apologize. I don't know the name of the podcast. I completely forgot. But he went on a podcast, and he talked a little bit about Sean Payton and what led to his release of the New Orleans Saints. I mean, you can tell, like, he was really upset at some of the things that w were transpiring, um, you know, upon him being released by the New Orleans Saints. And I have uh, a little bit of what Delvin Bro said. I have a little bit of what he said, and um, I just want to go ahead and break this down real quick, uh, let you know what he said, all right? This is a little bit of what Delvin Bro said in the podcast. He says, it was a tough time for me and my family. He said, he's talking about when he was misdiagnosed. He says, Sean Payton and him were not on good terms. Sean Payton treated him with absolutely no respect when I'm telling you this, man, something is wrong with my leg. And he's like, you are going to practice. The doctor says this and that. And it comes to a point in time you want to address this situation in private or you just want to sit up here and keep humiliating me in front of my teammates. He felt less of a man walking through the facilities because he didn't want to see Sean Payton. He says, because I did not want to see Coach because I already knew the situation we were in. He was always going to tell me something the way that he looked at me. He looked disgusted. And this is about the whole uh, misdiagnose of Delvin Bro's leg. You probably um, already know, but some of you may not know. Delvin Bro was out for like six weeks or something like that. He was supposed to be out for six weeks with a, uh, with a leg injury. And um, the orthopedic surgeon uh, looked at his leg and said that he had a contusion. But Delvin Bro still felt like something was going on with his leg. And um, he kept on, you know, talking about it. But it seems like Sean Payton didn't believe him. It seemed like he was trying to fake it to make it, if you will. But it turns out uh, when Delvin Bro went out and got a second opinion, he found out that his leg was indeed broken. He had a broken fibula, a fibula and not a contusion. And it, it led to Sean Payton firing the team's orthopedic surgeon. So Delvin Bro felt like he was betrayed by Sean Payton. He think that Sean Payton didn't like him. And he said that it was basically a mess uh, upon his release. Look, number one, I just want to say this, man. Uh, what these NFL players go through on a consistent basis trying to get onto the field, we will never know. We don't know the pain and the suffering and the heartache and pain that these guys endure just trying to get on the field. That's number one. Uh, number two, uh, these guys sacrifice a lot. You know what I'm saying? They sacrifice family. I mean, Delvin Bro, I think him and his wife end up being separated, you know, due to his love of the game. And, uh, you know, it, it's an it's unfortunate situation, man. I felt like Sean Payton, after he found out that the guy, uh, you know, was indeed injured, his leg was broken. I feel like he should have gave him a break. Um, I, I don't feel like Sean Payton, the way that it sound, never gave Delvin Bro an apology. He never apologized uh, to Sean Payton. I mean, Sean Payton never apologized to Delvin Bro. And it's unfortunate, man, because I feel like if he was going at this man like this and he was basically calling this guy a liar, uh, you know, he, he deserves to get this man... Uh, an apology, which it don't sound like he did. Uh, Delvin Bro was a decent cornerback for the New Orleans Saints. Look, I don't get the whole Delvin Bro spiel. I'm not really a big Delvin Bro fan. 
Uh, didn't really t too much care for him. I, I really just don't understand it. Most people just like him probably because, you know, of his story, which, I mean, was remarkable in itself. And also the fact that we just love ourselves some LSU players. Delvin Bro had one good season with the New Orleans Saints. One. One good season when he had three interceptions in one season. I think he had 19 pass deflections, and he had a pro football focus or rating of about a 75, which is really good. Okay, that was it. Delvin Bro played for the Saints for three seasons, and that's all he did. All he had was like one good season. The other season, the next season, he was out there getting roasted and toasted, and misused and abused. Every play, it was a holding call. Every play, it was a pass interference. It seemed like him and Brandon Browner were having a race on who was going to get more holding penalties in a season. That That's the reality of the thing. I just never really cared that much for Delvin Bro. Um, I feel like the Saints actually had an upgrade back in 2017 when Lattimore came along. And um, I understand that he had like one good game where he locked down Julio Jones and then everybody all of a sudden just think that he was just a lockdown corner, which he was not. OK, I got the notes right here. I got the stats right here. Look, I, I'm, I'm going to pull them up to y'all for y'all right now. For all those people that just think that I'm just hating on Delvin Bro. Back in 2015, Delvin Bro solo tackles. He had 42. That was 58. Okay, interceptions, he had three. He was tied for 12th. Targets, 82, tied for 34. And receptions allowed, he had 40, tied for 66. He had an overall 75.8. That is according to Pro Football Focus. 2016, okay, he had a rating of 53.8. It dropped. 21 solo tackles, he was tied for 114. Targets 35, he was tied for 110, and receptions allowed 21, he was tied for 113, which means that was just absolutely horrible, okay? 53.8 is not a good pro football focus score. Was not that good, folks, okay? Look, he deserves an apology from Sean Payton. I agree. But the fact that saying that he needs to come back to the Saints, I'm not on board with that. Uh, let's see. Jermaine, what's going on, man? Jermaine, appreciate you. Uh, TJ, the GOAT. Thank you, man. I appreciate that love. Ricky, what's going on? Sean, Jermaine, thank you very much for the $3 donation, man. Thank you so much, brother. Uh, Dada, morning, TJ, and chat, who that? Um, Cries, what's going on, man? T. Lewis, something happened to Keenan Lewis. Oh, same thing happened to Keenan Lewis. Yeah. Look, man. Keenan Lewis had issues with Dennis Allen. It seemed like Delvin Bro had issues with Sean Payton. But I have to agree, man. That, those 2015-2016 uh, type teams, the Saints had a lot of bad apples in the locker room. It was a bad, a lot of bad chemistry that was going on on the Saints team. And I really wasn't a fan of what was going on, man. It seemed like the team was going in a, in a bad direction. And that's even coming from uh, Drew Brees. Drew Brees said he even uh, contemplated retiring around that time so it was some some rough times in that man uh, appreciate you covering the delvin bro interview i did yesterday love your work man straight up saints podcast thank you so much brother you know thank thank you man uh thank you so much for your support and man y'all subscribe to his channel and uh, also check out straight out uh straight up saints podcast man that's what it was i apologize it's straight up saints podcast that's where you can check it out Go to Apple, okay? If you have the uh, iPhone, go to the podcast store. Uh, search uh, Straight Up Saints Podcast. Man, really good podcast, man. I mean, really in-depth. Um, uh, Straight Up Saints Podcast, you got a winner right there, man. <laughs> you got a winner right there. Like, that. that is some more. Uh, that can probably be on, uh, on a national stage or something like that, man. Great interview you conducted over there. But, um... DLP2600 says De uh, Delvin uh, was had many, many injuries. Dude couldn't stay healthy. That's true. That is absolutely true. Look, he, he couldn't stay healthy. He couldn't stay on the field. And when he was on the field, he was getting roasted and toasted, man. Look, bro, like, don't take my word for it. Go back and look at some of that footage, man, in 2016. I know y'all remember. I, I know y'all remember this man. When it was, I think it was, I don't know if they were playing against the Jaguars, they were playing against somebody else. When this man was like looking all up in the air and stuff like that, he, he lost the ball. He looking all up in the air 
I mean, it, it, it looked like he was like a den of headlights, man. I'll never forget that. Okay, and this guy just caught a pass on him, and, and I was like, wow, bro. And, and somebody just asked, I think I just seen it come across, Angelo uh, says, uh, is he worse than Eli Apple? In my opinion, yeah. I think he was worse than Eli Apple because Eli Apple had better seasons. than, than He only had one good season. Eli Apple, at least Eli Apple, you know, Man, he, he had some he had maybe like one or two decent seasons, man. And and honestly, before he got hurt with the Saints, man, he played pretty good. I, I just Delvin Bro had one good season. He had one good season. Out of all these, all this talk about him, about everybody just saying how good this guy was. One season, dude. One. I mean, we get on other Saints players for having one good season. We talk about well, what have you done for me lately? But people are acting like we lost Darrell Reavers or something. Or we lost Deion Sanders. Man, that dude wasn't that good. He was okay. But he wasn't that good. Uh, Eli Apple still waiting on a call. Not sure what happened with the Raiders, though. Uh, they couldn't agree with the money, Christ. Um, they, they couldn't agree with the money. Um, I think Eli Apple and his representation had one number and the Raiders had another. And they just couldn't reach an agreement. But, I mean, he's he going to find his way on another team. The only reason why uh, he hasn't found his way on another team is is simple, because of this whole pandemic. It's hard to uh, get guys signed, man, to get guys to go take physicals and stuff like that and see what type of shape they're in uh, when you can't uh, see it for yourself. Uh, you got to basically take a, a doc another doctor's work, uh, word for it, and those doctors don't even be a part of the uh, the team. So, uh, teams are kind of waiting for this whole pandemic to, uh, you know, kind of subside where they can make uh, decisions and they can bring guys in and see them uh, physically. Uh, I wouldn't be mad if the Saints decide to bring Eli Apple back maybe on a one or two year deal. Um, I wouldn't be mad at that, man. Probably line up. I mean, put him in the inside and help him and maybe, I mean, you know, be him and Patrick Robinson and maybe move P.J. Williams to the safety position. I think they'll be okay. I don't have a problem with that at all. You know, Eli Apple played pretty good for the most part. I uh, think he has a confidence issue, but I think his confidence will build uh, if he plays in the slot more so than outside. Playing on the outside is tough, man, because you're going up against elite competition. Um, when you're lining up in a slot, you're going up against some of those smaller receivers, um, you know, Unless you're going up against somebody like a Cooper Cup or something like that, you know what I'm saying? Like on a consistent basis, you should be okay and be able to hold your own, especially being six foot one, two hundred and eleven pounds. Uh, let's keep Apple far away from our Saints. We're good. Terry Smith, man, don't be like that, man. I'm telling you, Eli Apple is not as bad as people making him out to be. Look, you're going to get posterized sometime. You're going to get roasted and toasted. Um, you know what I'm saying? You're going to. Uh, passes are going to get caught on you. That's just a fact. You know what I mean? I mean, we talk about this all the time. Uh, the, the NFC South have some of the best receivers in all the football, and we talk about that, and I feel like we use that loosely. We, we, we use it to an advantage when we're trying to talk about other teams, um, and we won't want to compare our division to them, and we want to give those teams their comeuppance during that time, but when we're talking about our players going up against those guys, we want to act like they're going up against, uh, I don't know, um, man, just just give me somebody that wasn't that good, uh, not a good wide receiver. Like, we act like we're going up against the bottom of the of the barrel. Like, we're going up against Muhammad Sanu, uh, the, the New England Patriot type of Muhammad Sanu every single week, man. These guys are beasts. I mean, Mike Evans, Chris Godwin. I mean, honestly, Chris Godwin can be a number one receiver on anybody's team. Mike Evans is an incredible talent. O.J. Howard is an incredible talent, man. Bray, the tight end, he's an incredible talent. I mean, Julio Jones, Calvin Ridley. I mean, come on, man. Like, let DJ Moore. I mean, Curtis Samuel, man. These guys are beasts. And when we talk about these guys lining up against, uh, you know, this type of talent, how can y'all go out here and say that these guys are trash, okay? You know what I'm saying? And not really fully evaluate what these guys do. Of course you're going to get smoked. Of course you're going to get roasted and toasted. But when you're going up against people like Allen Robertson and stuff like that, he's getting the best of those competitions. When he's going up against uh, some of these other, you know, not so, you know, middle of the pack type cornerbacks, I mean, he's holding his own. 
I mean, wide receivers, excuse me, middle of the pack wide receivers, he holding his own. It's hard for you to hold your own against Julio Jones and you have to play him twice. Or Chris Godwin when you got to play him twice. Or Mike Evans when you got to play him twice, man. So you, besides that, I'm telling you, go. you don't have to take my word for it. Like I said, everything that I'm telling you right now has been researched. I want you all to see for yourself. Maybe you'll have a different perspective than me. But go back and go watch Eli Apple until after that Chicago Bears game. Only one big play he gave up, and that was a week one uh, deep pass to Will Fuller. And it was like right in the middle of the field. After that, Eli Apple was clamping down. I think people don't realize like when Marshawn Lattimore went down and he was like the primary number one corner, he was doing his thing. I mean, he was really doing his thing. I remember them playing against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. He was really out there handling business. And it wasn't until like he fell down and it was like a non-contact injury against the Chicago Bears. That's when everything kind of started going downhill for Eli Apple. So, I mean, just go check it out, man. I'm, I'm telling you, just go check it out. Don't take my word for it. Don't just think that I'm trying to protect Eli Apple because y'all know how I feel about Eli Apple and some of the things that I said about him. But I got to be 100, man. Like, I, I'm not going to sit up here and call a guy trash. I'm not going to sit up here and bash a guy and just, you know, not have any concrete evidence to prove otherwise. This guy was hurt. I mean, that Chicago Bears game, he left with a walking boot and played the next week. So ain't no telling what the Saints probably juiced him up with or numbed him up with in order for him to play for the next couple of weeks that led to him being injured a few weeks later. So, like I said, man, it was the tale of two cornerbacks, man. It was the tale of two cornerbacks. He had an outstanding training camp. He had an outstanding first half of the season. And after that Chicago Bears game, everything just started to go downhill from there. So, I mean, you got to put, you got to do the math, man. We got to be fair about this. We can't just call guys trash and, and, and not give them the benefit of the doubt or not do our research on that. That's not fair. I believe we do, but it's going to be a tough season and a division. Look, man, we always have a tough division. We, like The NFC South is one of the best divisions in football, and finally, it only took Tom Brady to come to the division in order for the national media to recognize the NFC South as one of the most competitive and best divisions in football. Oh, wow. What a difference a quarterback made. I mean, honestly, the NFC South should have been on the lips of so many other national media uh, aficionados, correspondents all the time for the last five to six years, man. If you look at the NFC South and the, the players and the, and the teams and, and, and all of this stuff that came with it, man, this is the most competitive division in football. And... They, they never really just get the respect. I, I mean, I understand why. Mostly because the teams are in the South. They're in smaller markets. Uh, nobody really pay attention to them. They're not really what you consider historical franchises. And, and honestly, the, the, the people, the, the, or the teams rather, that are in the division are basically uh, um, bottom feeders. You know what I'm saying? They have a history of being bottom feeders, if you will, man. Like, look. Let's, let's not get it twisted, all right? The Atlanta Falcons, once upon a time, weren't that good. Uh, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers weren't that good. The Carolina Panthers weren't that good. I mean, they had some up and down seasons, and we all know that the Saints weren't that good, you know, um, for a good extended amount of time. So they look at the history of these franchises, and, and they try to make that, uh, you know, apply to the present, which isn't fair because, I mean, I mean, the league changes from year to year. Team change from year to year. The narrative change from year to year. So if you look at it that way, and for the last 15 years, the NFC South has been one of the best divisions in football. And it is going to be a very competitive division. And I'm looking forward to it, man. I don't want to see, you know, I don't want to see what I saw last year. You know, like the division just being down. I mean, yeah, it felt good. As a Saints fan, you know, the Saints wrapped up the division by Thanksgiving. I mean, that was good. You know what I'm saying? Put your mind at ease. You knew that they were going to make the playoffs. But at the same time, man, you want to see something. You know, you want to be competitive, man. You know, you don't want to just go at that team's fan base and, and just be, you know, cracking jokes. You'll like to make it competitive or something like that. I mean, of course, we'll like to put our foot 
on their throats from time to time. But at the same time, we want to give the division credibility, man. And, and the more the credit, the more credibility the division has, the the better it looks when the Saints win that division. So I'm, I'm excited about it, man. I know it's going to be a good, hard fought race. But I think the Saints have the advantage, them and the Atlanta Falcons, due to the chemistry of the team. But I'm looking forward to it. I, I am. I'm looking forward to it. I, I never shy away from competition at all. Uh, I can't wait to see what the schedule looked like today. Yeah. Uh, look, I mean, look for another video coming tonight. You know, coming tonight is going to talk about the schedule and we're going to break it down. We're going to talk about W's. We're going to talk about L's. And we're going to be breaking down every team in the division. So y'all be on the lookout for that tonight. Um, it's not going to be live, um, but it is going to be, uh, you know, put up for you all to uh, see. And I uh, hope you all enjoy the video. Eli Apple was the most underappreciated player on our defense. People doubt him every week. Uh, that is, that is, I, I want to say... I got to take a look. Mm, I have to agree with you on that. I, I, have to, I have to agree with you on that one. I think he is. He was very underappreciated, even by me at times. You know, I, I felt like I was a little bit too harsh on the guy from time to time. I, I don't take back what I said, you know, but I felt like I was a little bit too harsh. And, um, you know, I, I do stand by. I feel like uh, he, he, he needs a little bit more dog in him. Uh, you know, I feel like his mom's too, too involved in his life. Uh, I think that she she just, you know, man, I don't know. She on that uh, LeVar Ball stuff. I, I can't get down with that. You know, I just feel like parents, um, we should be proud of our kids when they achieve things, but we should get the hell out of the way, okay? Look, my son, I don't know what he's going to be. I don't know if he's going to be into sports or anything like that when he gets older and starts to understand things. But if he does, man, if my son end up being a really good player in any sport, you know, I'm a I'm a love him and appreciate him from the sidelines, man. I'm not trying to spit, steal his spotlight. I'm not trying to gain notoriety based on his hard work, his blood, sweat, and his tears. And I feel I, I don't like when parents do that, man, because I feel like the parents be trying to live vicariously through their kids, and, and because of that, you know, what I'm saying they 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 not only do they coddle their kids, and, but they but they protect him from dealing and going through adversity. And I feel like that's what happened with Eli Apple, man, because his mom is always trying to go to war for him on social media, always just trying to have something to say. I feel like when he got drafted, all of a sudden, like she wanted to be some kind of newspaper writer and all that kind of stuff there. Like, let your child have his time, okay? Allow them to grow up. Allow them to make mistakes. Allow them to become their own man or their own woman, and, and and stay the hell out of the way, you know. I feel like Eli Apple. Uh, I feel like he has a, a he has really good talent, man. He he's a guy that can be an elite cornerback, man. But I feel like between listening to the white noise and, and paying attention to what everybody else is saying, and mama fighting your battles, and your mama up here, you know what I'm saying, still up here treating you like you're five years old. I mean, I feel like his career is suffering because of it. Um, you think the Bucks will beat us once this year? Yeah, I think they'll beat us. I think we're gonna split with the Bucks. I like Janoris and Lattimore combo on those boundaries. Yeah, Cross, I like it too. But the key word is depth because um, as much as I like these guys, I want to make sure that they actually have guys that can fill in. Saints need depth at the secondary in the secondary because uh, we've seen this over and over again. Guys getting hurt. And that's my biggest fear. You know, the Saints look good as far as like starters, but I feel like they need depth. They need guys that can play on the inside and the outside. You know, they, they always seem to get guys that can play on the outside, but it's only like two guys that can do it. They need depth. They need guys that can rotate. OK, I, look, I like the the reason I like the whole Zach Bond um, drafting is because this guy can play with his hand on the ground and he can stand up. He can play multiple positions, man. The reason I like the Mario Davis is because he can play in coverage and he can rush the quarterback. We have to find guys that can be Swiss Army knives, you know, the, the beat the, uh, Taysom Hill type players that can be multifaceted. That is how you win games, man. You gotta you can't just get guys doing just one thing. 
That's why I feel like the Saints suffered between 2010 and 2015 because the, the offense was just so predictable. The defense was so predictable. You knew what guys were going to do. You know when Darren Sproles was in the game what was going to happen. You knew when Robert Meacham was in the game what was going to happen. You know when Devery Henderson was in the game what was going to happen. It became so predictable. And I feel like the defense is kind of the same way. Okay, You know you have guys that can play on the inside. And you know if you if you get them somehow playing on the outside or if you have that 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 slot corner run a run a out route you know what i'm saying or they or they run a streak route you know like they you know that the slot corners are not going to have the pickup speed or the recovery speed if this slot uh slot receiver gets in front of that corner i mean it's the same old thing you need guys that can rotate okay it's not a guarantee that Marshawn Lattimore will play a full 16-game season. It's not a guarantee that Janoris Jenkins will play a 16-game season. Now, in a perfect world, that can happen, and we would love for that to happen, but we have to have guys that can be able to play both ways. I mean, we that's the reason why we like C.J. Gardner-Johnson. He can play the strong safety, and he can play in the nickel. I mean, you got to have guys that can do both things. You know what I'm saying? You can't just have guys that can just play on the inside. You got to have guys that can do it, do both of them. You know, and that creates depth. That's why teams try to go out and try to get guys like that. That's why uh, people like the Kansas City Chiefs, uh, you know, people like the, the Philadelphia Eagles, they did the same exact thing, you know, leading up into their Super Bowl run. You got to have guys that can do more than one thing. The NFC side will be more competitive. However, it's still a lot of division to lose. I agree with that, Cross. Like I said, the chemistry aspect of it. And, you know, like I said, dealing with this pandemic, you want to have guys that, that are familiar with one another. And, um, you know, one thing that, that helps teams at time is chemistry, guys knowing one another. PJ Jew says, what's up, TJ? Who that? What's going on, PJ? How you doing, man? Eli Honey Boo Boo Apple. <laughs> Should the Saints get Logan Ryan for depth? Uh, why no? Um, I, I like Logan Ryan. He's an outstanding uh, player. Um, I like the fact that he can play in the nickel and he can also play safety. Um, I like that part about him. But at the same time, Logan Ryan is an incredible talent, which means he demands a lot of money. And, and I, I feel like when you're dealing with guys like that, um, it, it might end up hurting your team in the long run because you end up losing players that have been with the team for X amount of years and you, you lose them because not that they're not good players, but because you can't keep them. OK, so Logan Ryan, I wish him good luck, uh, but he deserves uh, as much money as he can possibly get. But I feel like the Saints have bigger fish to fry, especially trying to pay some of these uh, 2017 draft players that they have. Bond is going to be a valuable piece on defense. I love his versatility. Yeah, I, I do too. Um, I, I think that that is the way, the new wave of a uh, linebacker, man. Linebackers got to be able to cover. Linebackers got to be able to tackle. And linebackers are um, going to be able to, going to have to be able to sack the quarterback. You got to be able to do all those things. Um, you know, teams are, uh, really paying attention to that, man. It's it's, it's a new wave. It's the days of Dick Buckus and you know and all those other great linebackers of the past. You know they used to wear the, the wear the neck rolls and all that kind of stuff and just big swole. You know what I'm saying? Like all those days are over. You know, like you got to be able to run sideline to sidelines and you got to be just as athletic as a a wide receiver, a, a tight end, a running back. You got to be able to have the upper hand. So. Um, if you're not doing that, then you're going to uh, fizzle out of the league. I look at somebody like Stefan Anthony. You know, Stefan Anthony, if this was 1995, 96, he'd probably be one of the best linebackers in all of football, man. I mean, his rookie season, he led the Saints in tackles. But the problem was he couldn't cover anybody. He, if, if he gets on a tight end, a tight end will beat him. If a running back gets out there on him, he gets beat. I mean, so... That, that whole, you know, 
I'm just a linebacker. I'm going to try to sack the quarterback. I'm just going to tackle uh, the running back after he do the halfback dive or, you know, he try to run in between the tackles. Like, those days are over, man. You got to be able to be athletic. Um, Isaiah Simmons for the Arizona Cardinals, man, That's he's he is the new wave. He is the new breed of linebacker. And if you don't have uh, some of those skills, then you're going to be somewhere on somebody's special team. Check in on Keep Pounding Podcast uh, and troll the Panthers fans. Y'all need to hear some of the trash they talk about in New Orleans. Look, I mean, look, this is the thing, folks. Um, they're fans. <laughs> I mean, they're fans. Like, okay, like, don't expect us to be talking about that team, okay? Don't, don't expect us to be talking about that team with love and and admiration or anything like that, you know what I'm saying? Because it ain't happening, okay? Because we're Saints fans. So I wouldn't expect anything different coming from a Panthers podcast, man. You know, like, I, look, it's all love at the end of the day, man. You know, I don't want to hurt anybody. I don't want to see nobody get hurt. I ain't trying to fight nobody over my love for the Saints. And I hope people are in their right minds to a point where they don't want to fight over their particular team. But... You know, like, we, it's all about love and passion for the team. And, of course,